you would think <laughs> yeah. that if there were aliens out there, that they would contact me. I mean, come on. Right. I'm the narrator of ancient aliens. Okay. I've got, I've got I'm gonna put access to Giorgio. Here. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to Far Out with Faust, everybody. I am Faust Chicho, and today I am delighted and honored to be joined by Robert Clotworthy. Let me tell you about Robert in case you don't know what he's been up to. Robert is the narrator of the History Channel's legendary show, Exploring the Unknown, which I know you heard of, Ancient Aliens. He has narrated every season from the start of the show. He's also the voice of StarCraft's major protagonist, Jim Rayner, and that's one of the biggest games worldwide, in case you're not into the, the, to gaming. He's the narrator of the hit treasure hunting reality show called The Curse of Oak Island, and that's very, very popular in Canada. He's narrated a pair of Emmy-nominated Star Wars documentaries, as, and he's appeared in numerous award-winning TV and films that you've definitely heard of. Robert, thank you so much for beaming in, man. It's an honor to have you. Oh, that uh, that introduction was was quite impressive. I I'd like to meet that guy. <laughs> <laughs> he sounds like a good so, time. Sounds right? pretty cool. Pretty interesting. <laughs> I heard he is. I heard he was. <laughs> yeah. So so my God, man. You know, you're. I feel like everyone has heard your voice. <laughs> yeah, so many people. It's, yeah. It's it's interesting. Um, you know, we just we just had a. Uh, convention a couple of weeks ago in Pasadena for uh, called Alien Con, which was dedicated to to ancient aliens. And I can't tell you how many people came up to me and said, I mean, one person said, you're the voice of my childhood, <laughs> which, which was kind of scary. But a lot of people say you're in our house. We have you on all the time. So, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting that um, my voice has somehow uh become such a big part of, of a lot of people's lives. Yeah. It's very cool, man. It's very yeah. cool. Um, you know, be, before they started working on Starcraft, Blizzard Entertainment was coming off like this massive success of the Warcraft games. Mm -hmm. And it was quickly becoming one of the hottest companies in gaming. And I'm like, did, I'm wondering, did you have any inclination that, that the game would become as big as it did? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to say, yeah, I knew it from the get go. No, <laughs> I, I was completely clueless when I, when I did the first um, uh, version, you know, the original StarCraft back in, goodness, I think it was ninety eight, ninety seven. I think it came out in ninety nine. Maybe it was was roughly at that time. And uh, I remember meeting with with Chris Metzen. I had a friend of mine who was working at Blizzard, and he said, "Hey, you know, they're doing this game." I know you're a voice actor. Uh, you know, why don't I see if I can get um, an audition for you? So of course I auditioned, mm -hmm. and I remember meeting with uh, with Chris sitting out. Uh, I, I want to say it was on the steps of some you know strip mall, <laughs> because I I don't I, Blizzard at that time certainly didn't have the major campus that they do now. Um, so a strip mall is probably uh, uh, you know minimizing yeah. the the experience only to only, only to make the story a little bit more impactful. But we were sitting out there and he had this sketch pad and he was showing me his original drawings of what he thought that uh the starcraft universe would look like and and in particular jim rayner and those those pictures that he showed to me that were in the sketch pad where we were sitting on the on the steps are now protected like the mona lisa it's in you know bulletproof uh, hermetically sealed you know and uh, uh probably worth a lot of money you know nitrogen encased uh <laughs> you know secure bulletproof glass kind of a kind of a thing at, at the blizzard headquarters but no i had i had no idea and uh it, i basically it was the first video game that i think i'd ever done oh and, wow and you know because it was way back in the early early days of it mm -hmm. and i remember many years later maybe it was seven or eight years later i'm trying to remember i was working on um a soap opera. I was uh, kind of a semi-regular on The Young and the Restless. I played the uh, the judge, the mean judge on the show. And you played a mean guy. Yeah, can you believe That's that? Crazy. What a shocker! I've, I've played a lot of mean guys. I've played, 
you know, car thieves and you name it. I've, I've, I've done it. It's not always nice guys, <laughs> um, which is actually a lot of fun. I just recently yeah. did um, uh, the new video game Hellboy, where I'm this kind of an evil Nazi character, the, the, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, yeah. the, the guy that's battling against, uh, you know, the bad guy in the Hellboy series. But um, I remember being on set and I overheard these two crew members talking about StarCraft. And I remember I thought, oh, wait a minute, I think I, I did that game. And I happened to mention to them that I was in, in that game. They said, oh, really, what, what character do you play? I couldn't remember. I thought, is uh, Jim Ryan, Ryan, Ryan? And they said, Jim Rayner? <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah, Jim Rayner. And their jaws literally <laughs> dropped. And uh, at that moment, I realized, wow, something's going on here that I had <laughs> no idea about. And uh, what I regretted the most about that was that I missed the experience of, of what this was all about, all the excitement, because I like to be a part of things. Yeah. I'm, I'm not one of those people that likes to necessarily watch. I like to get involved. So when uh, when it came time to do uh, StarCraft II, I really had to battle hard to be uh, to be a, to remain a part of of the mm -hmm. series. And one of the things that I really really desperately wanted to do was to have that that experience of of StarCraft II. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell you it was or you know, still going. It's it's an amazing amazing ride. Yeah. That's because that so that, char that character has positively impacted so many people. I've had so many fans that have come up to me and said that this was a game that they played with their, their father or their brother or, you know, their family members. They, they grew closer together in playing it. Uh, I've met people in the military that uh, used it as a, a strategy tool mm -hmm. when they were, uh, you know, I, I, as a matter of fact, I at the convention I met a guy who was, uh, 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 I guess, an uh, Iraqi war veteran, mm. and he was telling me how um, how much the the troops enjoyed playing the game together. This was something oh, that, so they, cool. that they would do. So yeah, it's 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 amazing that I've been a, been able to be a part of that. Plus, also with Ancient Aliens, that has been impacting so many people in such a, a positive way. That really is very, very gratifying and, and a lot of fun. Yeah, it's it's wonderful. You know, when your talents are, are get put to such positive use and you can mm -hmm. start to feel the effect and the impact that it has on, on the world at large. I mean, it's like, that's the dream, you know, I think I, I, I'm... <laughs> I was, uh, I did a lot of acting and filmmaking for, mm -hmm. for 20, 20 years. And then since I've, I've kind of refocused my efforts, uh, into my, my channel and my content, but you know, you, people don't understand when you, you get, so you, you get auditions and they come and they go and you know, you don't, you don't know how big something's going to, I mean, even sometimes when you go in for something that is bigger, um, you know, those are the ones sometimes that you don't end up getting anyway. Uh, and they, you never know what they're going to do. They could, they yeah. end up never even seeing the light of day but you know the ones that blow up are usually a a surprise <laughs> it's it's a total fluke uh, yeah. so with with starcraft i knew that it was popular uh, but i didn't know it at the time fortunately i was i was there for all of starcraft 2 and it's been an amazing experience and with ancient aliens that show started out as a 2 hour documentary that was it right and i i narrated quite a few documentaries up till then and uh, the producers called me up and wanted me to to do this and I said of course you know I've worked with them many times and as um, the late creator of the show Kevin Burns would say um, well, you know I know he, he said this 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 is incredibly rare when something like this happens because mm -hmm. they they sold the show to to History Channel and History Channel at that time, I don't think they were expecting or anticipating very much. And they kind of dumped it on the network and they put it on at weird hours, you know, three in the morning, yeah. six in the afternoon. I mean, weird, weird times that you wouldn't think anybody would uh, be watching television. And yet it found an audience and the network would then ask the producer for, you know, can we do three more? And he goes, yeah, sure. Okay. I'll do three more. And then they said, well, you know, those are working. Can we, can you do another five or six? And, and he, he would joke. He'd say, listen, I'm running out of pyramids. What do you want me to do? And he said, well, are you, are, 
they say, well, what, are you, does that mean you're not going to do the show? He says, of course I'm going to do the show. I'm just, I'm just saying. Well, yeah. it's now turned from where, you know, and I think we're now in our officially our 19th season, which is crazy. Yeah. That, and well over 200 hours uh, of television, where at the beginning, we were having a difficult time finding topics to do shows yeah. about. Now, you know, with what's happening in the world, mm -hmm. uh, especially when it comes to UFOs and disclosure, uh, yeah. disclosure and uh, we have so many options to go to. And there's so much information out there that we're in a very, very fortunate spot. And the quality of the shows, I think, has has remained incredibly high. Yes. We're kind of the, the tip of the spear when it comes to getting the information out there. We're the, we're the granddaddy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it's, and it's nice to see all these, uh, other programs that are kind of trying to, yeah, you know, follow suit a little bit. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a compliment and they're, they're not us. That's okay. Yeah. But, uh, but more and more people are interested in the topic where we used to be the outliers. Now it seems that it's much more mainstream. And you guys are, are in part, I think, responsible for that. And, 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 you know, there's, there's this wonderful balance that happens, you know, and you start to see it and experience it in the universe and in, uh -huh. and in your life, you know, and there was a, you know, the entire disclosure and the, the notion of ancient and any, basically anything aliens was really the drug through the mud for a lot of reasons for decades. Yeah. Right. And, 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 and a lot of those reasons are coming out now and whatever the excuses are, it was, it was deceptive and it was dishonest, I think for the parties responsible to do that to people who, you know, were experiencing things and uh, seeing things. And, um, you know, but you, but once something is, is in the psyche of, of a society and a people, you know, you I mean, you can try and condition it out, but I feel like it's there, you know, and, and there's an interest there that, that remains people, it resonates with people. Yeah. And I, and when you guys came out, I just think that, you know, and it was on the history channel, mm -hmm. it just like, it gave everyone permission <laughs> to kind of, you know, feed that that quiet interest that they yeah. had you yeah. know and, and it's so cool because it, it really helped to kind of recondition the thinking in society whereas it's not like yeah. it's not just farmer joe on his you know yeah it, it, it's no longer <laughs> you know two guys out in a swamp on a yeah you know in a skiff uh, getting drunk and seeing lights no it's exactly. it's it, it's now video it's it's that the the evidence yeah. is out there the proof is, is out there and it's difficult to to deny it, you know, let's say every, every bit of information out there, except for one is, is wrong. Well, right. You only have to be right once. That's right. For the, for it to be true that there, there are other creatures out there and that they're, uh, they're following us or involved with us. Or, I mean, there's so many questions. So many. When you, when you think about the, how long this planet has been around and what's transpired over the last billion plus years, how many civilizations mm -hmm. have, have gone and uh, yep. come and gone. Uh, maybe we're just the latest, uh, you know, version of, uh, of humanity on this planet. There've been other versions numerous times before that. There's a lot of, uh, a, a lot of, let's call it evidence coming to the forefront that, that truly, you know, substantiates that. Uh, yeah. and, 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 and even having, they're people. having congressional hearings there, you know, come on, it's, <laughs> it's, they are. You're, you're not crazy. You know, it used to be everybody was wearing a tinfoil hat and you thought, okay, they're, they're insane. Now, of course, you know, you go to alien con, there are going to be, you know, there was a guy that was dressed up in bubble wrap. So, okay. <laughs> I, 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 he might've worn I, that to any convention. Yeah, I, yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> you know, he's, he's a trendsetter. He's uh, yeah. he's a styler. He's, you know, you'll see him on the cover of uh, a Vogue or, or GQ very, 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 very <laughs> soon. But for every one of those, there's going to be a dozen or more people that have legitimate experiences that, that uh, you can't really deny. So and, uh, you know, I'm, it's kind of interesting people, because I'm the narrator of the show, there's this, I guess, level of, of comfort that they have yeah. with me, a little familiarity that they have with me, uh, as opposed to just going up to say Giorgio and getting into a conversation with me. I'm, I'm part of the family. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've had people say, listen, I went 
to grad school listening to you. You got me through nursing <laughs> school. Or, you're and, you're and playing I joke, nonstop. Yeah. Yeah. I say, I joke. I say, listen, you know, Friday night, set a place at the table for me and I'll have, I'll have dinner with you. <laughs> I, you know, I, I feel like I'm there. Um, people tell me they, they fall asleep listening to my voice. I mean, it's really rather, yeah. rent, rather intimate. I haven't had anybody say that they've, uh, <laughs> yeah, they had a kid while listening to me. That's that, that hasn't happened yet, but, uh, you know, who knows? Who knows? Yeah. As far as you know, they might never admit something like that. Uh, that's true. I mean, the, the one, you know, one kid came up and he, you know, looked like he was 13 or 14 years old. And, and he said, you know, you're, you're the voice of my childhood. And I thought, oh my goodness, he's been listening to me since he was born. Yeah. Um, but you know, a lot of people will turn on the TV and, uh, put on the show on a, on a loop and they'll either fall asleep. One lady told me that her dog, <laughs> you know, if her dog's getting kind of crazy, puts the show on, the dog will, will knock out. People tell me that their, wow. you know, their baby has a little bit, a little bit of trouble getting to sleep to put on the show and I, I put them to sleep, but they always say, they always qualify it. They always say that, that it, uh, I put them to sleep in a good way. Right. So right. I take well, that, that as a, as a that's compliment. That's good to hear. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, for some reason, my voice is soothing. It's comforting. It kind of, uh, puts you into that place. And yeah. Even if I'm telling you scary stuff. Right. Um, people get a sense that it's going to be okay. No, that's awesome though, man. That's, yeah. uh, there's something to be said about that. You know, it must have been like such a incredible eye opening experience, you know, and you get, do you get the new scripts like, you know, every week, how, you know, how far in advance do you get them before you record them? And, and like, what, what, what was that experience like? Like, uh, because, you know, I mean, your excitement, I mean, you're, you're just, you're fantastic at what you do, yeah. but, but, you know, as an actor, I know that some material, you know, I get, I get, I just naturally get excited and passionate about it. It's, it's yeah. easier for me. I don't have to fake it, you know? Yeah. And, and, you know, it's, it's very clear to me, you know, how, how that's in your voice. And, and, uh, I'm just like, you know, what, what episodes got you kind of the most excited when you were, when you were reading them and, and what are some of your favorites? I'm just curious. Well, f first, my, my process of going into the studio is, is kind of unique. Um, I don't get the scripts in advance. I don't want to oh, know. You don't, okay. No, I don't get it. In, I don't want to know. Uh, I'm really good about getting the words off of the page. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been doing that since I was a little kid when I, you know, you know, of course I played sports and did all kinds of crazy things. But one of the things I really loved doing was reading out loud. And I would get a story, a book, whatever it might be, and I would read it out loud having never read the book before or never, having never read that story. And I would challenge myself to see if I could, I don't want to say perform it, but kind of read it to where it, made sense, not knowing mm -hmm. if, if that sentence was going to be a question or, a, or an exclamation point, or what it might be. So I, I, I kind of had to intuitively get a sense. Yeah. One eye would kind of like a lizard. One eye would go here, the other guy yeah. would, would, would go there. So I'm kind of knowing where I'm going at the same time I'm, I'm reading what it is I'm reading. So I'm really good about getting the word off the page. And I also like to be very present mm -hmm. with in, in the moment. I want to be very truthful when I'm I'm reading. And so I want whatever that experience is, whatever that information that's that I'm seeing on the page, if I'm excited about it, I that yeah. I allow that excitement to be a part of my read. You know, a few weeks ago we did an episode that just aired I think it was about a week and a half ago uh about aliens in our airspace where which where it was pilots, commercial pilots, private mm -hmm. pilots describing experiences that they had had in the air with UFOs or UAPs. Mm -hmm. uh, and I found it to be really, really fascinating. You know, I'd read something and I'd go, oh, this is really cool. Yeah. Oh, you've got to be kidding. This re oh, man. And, <laughs> I, uh, and I just kind of went into it that way. Um, now, when it comes to favorite episodes, that one that was on just a couple of weeks ago was certainly one of my favorites. I think that we have... I don't want to say crossed a bridge, but we're, we're, you know, now that what we're doing has so much credibility associated. Yeah. I don't even know if that's the correct word, but there's so many people that are discussing it and talking about it. These questions are not strange that uh, we're now able to put forth this information and uh, people are more 
you know, willing yeah. to, to accept it, more willing to seriously consider it. So that's, that's really nice. My personal all time favorite, and plus the, the show is really fascinating. I mean, mm -hmm. it's scary when you hear actual radio communications between yeah. a pilot and a control tower and they're describing what it is they're seeing in real time. And you can hear the fear in their voice or, or whatever it is. You know that that's not faked. Right. You know, this, this is not something that was that AI created and we kind of, right. you know, put it into a computer and spit it out. No, this is, this is the real deal. These are people having experiences. And my own personal favorite was an episode that we did uh, about, well, we've done a couple of episodes about the moon because the mm. moon to me is incredibly fascinating. It is, it is unlike any moon that we have yeah knowledge of in the universe you know it is the perfect distance yeah be, uh, be, from the earth to the sun to where you, you can have a, a solar eclipse it's 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 um <laughs> it, it's, it's remarkable it, it, you know if we if we if it wasn't there you know the, the earth happens to be tilt on an uh you know tilt on an axis if the moon weren't there we wouldn't have tides wouldn't have seasons it's like and there's and there's only one of them Right. You know, a lot of most planets have and multiple it's huge. moons. It's, it's, and it's, it's huge. It's, it's, it's and it's huge. it's exactly the perfect size at exactly the, the right distance. What mm. are the odds of that? Yeah. That that is that's crazy. Now, there are theories yeah. that the moon is hollow. Now, do I know this? I don't know. But I did speak with uh, with a woman who I met at a convention who was a real scientist mm -hmm. who was actually part of the NASA program. She was a she was in mission control. She worked on the Apollo missions, space wow. shuttle missions, and she's a very, very serious person. And she told me <laughs> that she has heard the ringing of the moon. Yeah. You know, her job was to monitor the vital signs of the astronauts when they were on the moon, for example, right? Apollo 16. And here's a person not saying you know, there's a rumor. It's like, no, I've heard it. It's like, yeah, what? Okay. What else have you seen or heard? Well, she says, I was basically in mission control when Ron Evans and Apollo 16 came from the back from the dark side of the moon. We came back into radio contact and uh, the commander of the mission who was on the moon said, hey, Ron, you, you feeling lonely up there? And he said, and Ron responded by saying, I'm not alone. Yeah. And later in that conversation, which, uh, you know, Mission Control switched to, to a more right, secure channel, mm -hmm. they, he described being followed yep. by a craft that he said was not Russian, was not American, was roughly 40 feet in length that he called sausage-shaped, which is yep. between sausage-shaped and tri triangle-shaped. Those are the two most common uh, mm -hmm. uh types of UFOs that people experienced it, it followed him information for three and a half revolutions around the moon and then disappeared. <laughs> so, and this is a guy who was a former fighter pilot in Vietnam. Yeah. And she later was on the recovery ship, the recovery ship when they got the Apollo capsule out of the ocean. Wow. He's sitting there in a stateroom and she's talking to him about his experience. And he's telling her, I don't know what it was. It yeah. was really weird. So, um, you know, that, that's why the moon to me is one of those, those great mysteries. I'm, mm. it, you know, she's told me that they've seen, uh, you know, buildings on the moons, things that look like, oh, uh, yeah. like satellite Structures. dishes. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. How, how do we, how do we not know this? And I asked her, I said, it's been censored. It's been edited. Well, I, I asked her, I said, what is the philosophy of NASA? She says, well, we all pretty much believe there's something out there. She's been to parties where astronauts have been and they've discussed mm -hmm. common experiences that they've had in space. And I said, well, like with this Ron Evans thing, what, what happened with that? She goes, well, NASA, she goes, we actually had a meeting about it. And NASA is not in the business of explaining what happens. They gather the information. And they give it to the brain trust, and yeah. those people figure it out. So they they were basically told, "Don't talk about it because we don't know what it is." Yeah, you know, that's the claim. So when you, yeah, so when <laughs> you have yeah, so when you have firsthand information like that, added to the fact that I mean, the moon is is beautiful anyway. It's yeah, it's mysterious. It's uh, you know, you know, from watching uh, werewolf movies as a kid, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's there's power to that. 
And you wonder, you know, in, in the in the show we theorized, was it somehow towed there? Yeah. Was it placed there purposely? Uh, what's going on? It doesn't orbit. That we we see the same side all the time. Mm-hmm. So I was no, just that's one of my personal favorites. I love that. I love that. Um, there's so much mystique about yeah. the moon, and it's yeah. such a it's a you know all these inspirations and muses that have come from it. They come from it for a reason. You know, I don't think life as we understand it and know it and recognize it would be on the planet without the moon. And I think that, you know, there's, it will come out, I think in our lifetime, just how busy the moon actually is compared to what we've been told up until that point, you know? And like you said, I was just listening to this guy was, uh, he worked uh, for the CIA. He worked for Lockheed Martin, mm-hmm. uh, like he, a life, a lifelong guy. Um, and um, he was giving some rare testimony. He's old, he's old now, which yeah. is I think the only reason why he's he's talking about this. Yeah. But he's not he, it, he's not very optimistic. <laughs> I can say that about him, you know. And he absolutely believes everything he's he's yeah. saying. He thinks that there's not a chance in hell that they're ever going to disclose. Uh, the truth to the people because there's too much money to lose, um, you know, because the technology that they've come into, you know, would basically um, collapse the, the, you know, I, everything that we fight over is, is, is energy related uh, industrial wealth, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, America's interests in a lot of ways, sadly have become, that's become, you know, the, the code word for, we're coming for your oil. We have to secure our interests, you know? Um, and it's, I mean, it's not an, an exclusively American phenomenon. It, it, it's unfortunately it's, it's become a global thing. And this technology apparently would really, I mean, make all of that absolutely useless. And we have economies built on that. And that, you know, yeah. so now you're talking about trillions of dollars, uh, hundreds of trillions, if you yeah. extrapolate. So, you know, I, I, I love listening to this guy because he was like, you know, he was like, listen, let me tell you something. The moon was towed, towed here, you know, for earth. It's been here for, I mean, you know, just very matter of factly, yeah. like trying to like, you know, saying what he's obviously known for a long time. And I was like, man, yeah. this guy, he's something else. He, I mean, he, he definitely believes what he's saying. And, uh, and I, of course I, you know, being very much into this, I believe that the moon is very much occupied <laughs> that it's not, you know, that we got there. And the reason why we didn't go back is because they were like, uh, next time you guys going to come visit, maybe call ahead, uh, until then, see you later. <laughs> you, well, know? All, you know, it's also interesting that a lot of these astronauts that have had those experiences, they don't talk about it. Mm-hmm. You'd think that, you know, you go to the moon. I mean, come on, how many people, have actually stepped foot on the moon. And you would think that that would be the most amazing, incredible experience of your life. And they come back and they're, they're mm. almost like, as if they're traumatized. The, I, you know, Neil the, Armstrong didn't really want to talk about it anymore. No. He and was traumatized. Think, yeah, you think, what happened? What was the experience up there? What What's going on that that puts you in that mindset? You know, Charles Lindbergh, when he crossed the the Atlantic, there, you know, he, he you know, yeah, it was almost incumbent upon him that people were going to ask him about the experience, and he would talk about it because I mean, he was a hero. Yeah, Neil Armstrong, they, you know, these guys were heroes when they came back, and then they just kind of disappeared. They were debriefed, and uh, I, I think Maybe. unfortunately, or they the, had an experience. Were, yeah, yeah. Oh, they definitely had an experience. I think they had two experiences, right? They had the one in space <laughs> and then they had another one when they got back and they were sat down yeah. and they were told, I think what would happen to them if they, if they yeah. shared with what they saw. And then, and unfortunately they have a way of doing that, that is traumatizing and that, that, you know, kind of gets them to, to not even, th- it, you know, it is a, it is a conditioning that the CIA does and has learned to do. And it's scary that they do that. And it's scary that they would, that they, you know, they're still trying to hide this. Um, and people like buzz, these guys who train their whole lives yeah, and they, they, I mean, they, but this guy, these guys went to the moon and at they least, come at least back. Buzz Aldrin comes out and, and talks. So he's, he's been yeah. on the show. Yeah. Uh, I think some of them work through a lot yeah. of the, yeah. 
the stuff that happened to them when they got back. Um, because I don't think they were allowed to talk about it. I think they were yeah. put through certain programs to make sure they didn't talk yeah. about it. Um, unfortunately, but, but that's so cool, man. You must have, you, I mean, when I, when I hear be. stories like that, I just think we're never going to be get, get canceled. <laughs> I'm just thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking job security. This is yeah. great. I, I love it. I love it. It's awesome. Yeah, that's yeah. true. It's, it's exciting. Be, you know, I, I've gotten to know Giorgio very well. Um, we've become very, very good friends who's, uh, you know, I guess the, the meme of the show, the, the world knows mm-hmm. him as the guy with the hair and, uh, David Childress and Nick Pope, uh, uh Travis Taylor, who's actually a real rocket scientist. Mm-hmm. He's got not just one, two PhDs. He's working on his third. <laughs> it's like, wow. wait, wait a minute. These guys are, are, are very serious. Very and, serious. you know, you sit in the room just. You know, I'm just, I'm almost comic relief. I just kind of sit there and, and listen to them talk, and it blows your mind. Yeah. The 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 not just the questions they ask, but some of the I don't want to say answers, but some of the things that they discuss that are so profound and so confusing that you know you gotta you gotta any person with half a half a brain is gonna go wait a minute that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. You're right. This. Why, what's going on here? You know, how, yeah. you know, even if it's very simple, like how the pyramids were built. Um, how? So many what? megalithic <laughs> structures. How were they built? How did this, that happen? I mean, you know, and, people say, well, they, du- they dug a hole and they put them down because you can't lift them up. Well, okay. <laughs> why would they do it? Because nobody's buried in them. What, what's no. the purpose? And why would it take, you know, hundreds of years to do something like that. Why, why would you do it? Um, why, why would you do it? Why would you create? And the, and, and I don't buy the expo. I'm the, you know, if people write it off and be like, well, if they, all you need is a hundred people and you can move that rock. And I'm like, um, a hundred people and some rope. And, yeah, the, 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 and then how are you going to, tr- not a lot of trees there <laughs> that you can roll it over. Like, I don't, I don't understand that. The, the, how have you whisked away this? Well, yeah, yeah. Maybe the maybe the bottom layer. Okay, that, yeah. well, as soon as you have to lift one up and put it on the other, that gets a little bit challenging. Yeah. So, <laughs> and the one on the top. How about that guy? I mean, exactly. What would they build a scaffolding? <laughs> I mean, I you know, like I don't I don't understand the dismissal and the and like the. the it's like because it's not so easily explained in our yeah. materialistic world you know people are people just write it off and 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 i'm just like but wait a minute we don't even know how they built it let alone what they built it for you know what i mean like it's it's and and, you know we're discovering more and more that what's left of these structures is just the top it's literally just the beginning you know that they we we, we did a show about a structure a pyramid that was built upside down beneath the surface of of the earth Wow. It goes in the opposite direction. It's up in, what do they call it? The, I think it's called the Black Pyramid or something. I'm trying to remember what, what it was. We Ooh, did a whole I episode look into that. that. It's like in, under, under, under ice or something. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. And like yeah. Antarctica, I'm just like. Don't get me um, started. Don't get me started. <laughs> there's, 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 even, there's even Nazis involved with that one. Okay? I know it. I, and I, I know it. And I try to tell people and they're like, you're crazy. I'm like, you know, if you listen to the testimony of, of Admiral Byrd when he got back, not yeah. before he got back to America, because once yeah. he got back here, they were like, they did the same thing to him with that they did to the astronauts. They yeah. were like, you're going to sit down and shut up yeah. and stop talking. But he had a chance to talk because he took, you know, he had, it took a long time to get back from Antarctica back in like, I think it was 47, right? Yeah. And he talked to a lot of people on the way home and they remember what he said because yeah. what he said was very memorable, memorable, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, people who dismiss that, I'm like, what do you think? I mean, this this was a dude who even the Germans saw it yeah. when they were planning to go, you know, because yeah. they knew he was one of the few people who actually flew it. Yeah. And he inv- they invited him to Germany, and he was like, ah, you guys are you guys are doing some things. We we call yeah, wind up over here. I mean, yeah. uh, this Nazi thing is not working out. I, <laughs> I, I, might, I might want to bail on this. Yeah, um, but but and. It's just, it's incredible to me how dismissed it is. And, and yeah. I would love to know what, you know, I, I know it's been 
it's just, it's vast now, you know, yeah. what they found and what they built and what was there already. And it's just, there's so much to it. Yeah. Um, I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to do like one of, one of my specials. I have a show called believers versus skeptics. I do. And uh -huh. I'm going to, we're going to, our next episode is going to be the truth about Antarctica <laughs> and I'm going to go at it with my, my skeptic Good. friend. Yeah. I think, and I he, think we've done at least two episodes uh, about yeah. that. And it's fascinating. It's, it is fascinating. And also Linda Moulton Howe, as I recall, yeah, she interviewed somebody that actually claimed to have worked there, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. He had some incredible details. I mean, yeah. if he was storytelling, then he should have been sitting at a typewriter or a computer yeah. because he should be writing a book. I mean, yeah. uh, very, ta I, you know, it's, he was anonymous, if I recall. And so I couldn't hear his voice, yeah, but yeah. his, you know, you could hear him and the, the rhythm with which he spoke and the, the details with which he gave yeah. us, like, you know, he didn't, it didn't sound like anyone making up a story. And Linda's not in the business of interviewing, you know, the, 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 the hardcore whistleblowers go to Linda, you know, they have oh, yeah, for yeah, years. Yeah. She's. She's serious. She uh, unfortunately was not at this latest alien con. She had a, a prior commitment, but she's fascinating to be around. Yeah. And one of the things that's amazing about her is <sighs> she never stumbles when she speaks. Yeah. She can go on and on and on. She never has a, 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 a never a pause, no. never a stumble. In fact, you know, the, uh, the, we joke a little bit sometimes that they have, when they're interviewing her for the show, sometimes they have to purposely interrupt her just <laughs> so they have an opportunity to make an edit. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Cause she can go on and she remembers everything. She is, she'll she's say, Oh yeah, so December smart. 2nd, 1972, this article on the third page of this, like, whoa. And just yeah. comes up, up with it like that. She's, and, people, and when she's at these conventions, people adore her. Oh, I'm sure. Oh, she, she's so charismatic, so interesting, so uh, so eloquent. It's and it's a, a joy to to be around her. They they all are actually yeah. all the people that are on the show. It's amazing the uh, how not only how well we all get along because we all are really really good friends, and they're also very charismatic. So, mm -hmm. you know, you want to listen to what they have to say. They're incredibly intelligent and uh, there's no real fighting. Yeah. <laughs> there's no clash of egos. It's like everybody is there to support one another and encourage one another and intrigued. Yeah. And, and they're all open to new information. Nobody's like, you know, locked into one position and refuses to, to budge. No, as new information comes out, opinions change. So the there's serious uh, there's serious brain power up there. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a the show is is readjusting paradigms as it goes right. and, and right. exposing people to, you know, it's an expanded awareness, you know, to to start to think outside of this this world, and and so I. I it's very much in line with, with the spirit of the show, which is awesome. Yeah. Uh, and so cool. It must be, I mean, what a dream job, I think for, for oh, I'm so lucky. I, I'm yeah. so incredibly it's lucky. So cool, man. You know, first of all, to have any job that goes more than, than a week or two, I mean, I've yeah. done, you know, you name it, I've done it. I've been on all kinds of TV shows, everything going back to emergency and the Waltons and Rockford files to, I saw, I was looking with, at all your credits, yeah. <laughs> you know, Columbo to working with, uh, with Clint Eastwood and yeah. Bradley Cooper and American sniper. So I I've worked with tons of people on, on lots of great projects, but to have two, two things, number one, Starcraft that's lasted well over a decade. I mean, like, mm -hmm. First started in what 1999. Now we're in, you know, it's 24 years later, and it's it's still out there. And to have Ancient Aliens and the Curse of Oak Island, Ancient Aliens our 19th season, Curse of Oak Island our 10th season, and Curse of Oak Island to still be as popular as it is, it's still pulling in <laughs> close to three million people every Tuesday night. Wow. And Ancient Aliens, which has become just, I mean, South Park made fun yeah. of us. 
You know you've made it. You know you've made it. Yeah, when absolutely. When South Park has made fun of it. I've even been on a couple of shows. I did a a, a, a cartoon a series, a, an episode of a thing called China, Illinois. And I did it. The first one was I did a fairly decent impression of Kevin Costner. So they needed a Kevin Costner voice match oh, cool. for, for the show. And I did that. Turned out that the producers, creators of the show were huge fans of ancient aliens. Uh -huh. And so they wrote an episode for me to, you know, to be, to be, to be on the series. And yeah. I thought, you know, it'd be funny. And I and it was, I was played a teacher. His name was Carabas. I said, you know, it'd be funny if this character spoke the same way that I, when I, when I narrate ancient yeah. aliens. Yeah. So I did it the entire way and it was so much fun. I said, I bet. Fun, you, know, you know, like in ancient aliens, is it possible? Could it be? <laughs> I would say, I would say, my name is Carabas. <laughs> it is a pleasure to meet you. <laughs> that is so awesome. We had, we had a lot of fun, and it, and it was hysterically funny. Hysterically I'm funny. sure everyone went crazy. In fact, sure. in fact I, I worked on uh, this movie, uh, Red Notice. So I just noticed my collar has kind of come out of, up in the back. Oh, my goodness. It's horrible. Um, uh, this movie called Red Notice that came out a couple of years ago with, uh, actually about a year and a half ago, with uh, Gal Gadot and Ryan Reynolds and, um, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to remember, who was that, who was that guy? Oh, yeah, uh, Dwayne Johnson. Oh, you know, yeah, that couple guy. A couple people you heard of. And the director of the of the movie, um, a fellow ma named Ross and Marshall Thurber, contacted me, and he said, you know, this is like a, a dream for an actor to get a, a major A-list director to contact you directly and say, you know, it would really mean a lot to me if you would be a part of my film. I'm thinking, yeah. To, is he writing? Does he know he's talking to? I'm just a, yeah. you know, I'm just a guy. I'm just a, a, you know, a journeyman actor. But he was a huge, or is a huge fan of Ancient Aliens. Yeah. And so he wrote that opening of that movie with me in mind because he said, man, this is what I want. How, this is yeah. how I want my movie to start out. So if you, if you watch the movie and when it first came out on Netflix, huge, huge hit. Yeah. People thought it was an episode of ancient aliens. The <laughs> first thing you, first thing you hear is, is me. So it was it's very amazing. flattering and it's amazing. The people out there that uh, are, are, are fans of the show. It's, it's, yeah. you know, these, these are talented, creative, intelligent, bright people. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, awesome. and, and so, I mean, my, my goodness, here I am uh, involved w with something like this. And who would who would have thunk, right? I mean, come on, this is this is crazy. It's, it's so uh, cool. I, man. I'm so I feel so incredibly blessed and so fortunate. You, you are my friend. Um, you know, I, I I I know a little bit about Clint Eastwood's directing style. I uh, okay. <laughs> my acting coach was Hillary Swank's action sure. coach okay. and she, obviously she's, she's worked with him a lot. And, yeah. uh, I know how he, um, I know, I, I know how he's, you know, two, two, three takes and, uh, you're moving on whether you're ready or not. You know, I'm wondering if that, if that, if that was how, when you were, actually, when you uh, were well, I'll, I'll, from somebody who was there in the room, I'll tell you the yeah. story. Tell um, me. first of all, you, when you audition, you don't on, audition in front of Mr. Eastwood. Now everybody calls him Clint. I, you know, yeah, they in a, in a mistake call him Clint, but, it, but you know, I, he's, he's, he's too good. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not part of the, yeah. his inner circle. So you don't get to audition in front of him. Everything is put on videotape. And what I heard was that when he was starting out as an actor, he really didn't like the audition process and he doesn't like, you know, it's uncomfortable for yeah, actors. It's, it's, you know, the pressure is on. It's, you know, it's, it's, un, it's, a, it's a weird thing to go into a room and have to perform. I mean, it's, 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 it's its own animal. You know? it's, 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 it's its own animal. I mean, I, you know, I, I kind of miss actually going in and doing that because now auditions more and more, you videotape it at your house oh, and you send it in. And it's, I, I miss the interaction yeah. with, with the people in the room. I, I think that that's, as important as the yeah. audition is everybody that does an audition, you know, at, when you're a professional, they're all pretty good. I mean, yeah. They and can it's on tape. It. They can do as many tries as they want. Yeah. So, so no... it's nice to be able to kind of get it exactly where you want it to be. But at the same time, you miss that experience or that opportunity to yeah. make a personal connection with the people that, that are in the room. Well, 
So I did my video audition, and then my agent contacts me and says, uh, you're, you know, Mr. Eastwood is interested in, in you for, for this role. You know, hasn't decided yet, but it looks like looks pretty good. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, this is this is amazing. I had I had read Chris Kyle's book. I would heard mm-hmm. interviews with him on the radio. So I was really fascinated by his story. Yeah. And I was I really wanted to be a part of the film. I thought, wow, this is this is such an important project. It's Clint Eastwood. I mean, mm-hmm. please let the, let this happen. Well, as luck would. I ended up getting the part. So, you know, and it was a nice scene that I, w- I had with Bradley yeah. Cooper. So it's, you know, you're working with a star. So there's that kind of yeah. pressure that's going going through your brain. You're also going in working a day. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're doing all the, all the stuff in one day. So it's not like you go there and you get to know everybody and you're working a few weeks and your comfort level yeah. is great. And it's, you know, it's easy peasy. So there's all this pressure that's kind of put there. And you're trying, you know, you want to make sure you memorize your lines. You want to make a good impression. The first time you're ever going to meet him is when you're literally on the set with him. And then just before we were going to shoot one of the scenes, the uh, the writer knocks on the uh, the door to the dressing room, and he says, "Hey, Robert, um, and I'd met him before." Yeah. He said, "Um, "The uh, (laughs) Clint." He said, "Uh, "Bradley uh, wants to expand on the scene." Oh. And I'm thinking. Nice. Well, you know, you're going, yeah, nice. But at the same time, you're thinking, what does that mean? Uh, yeah. Am I, am I going to get a whole new rewrite here? Yeah. I've been well, working on these lines, and now it's like, yeah. you know, 15 minutes before I'm going on, i got to memorize, what, you know, what does that mean? And he says, he goes, no, Bradley wants to, um, you know, there's a lot of elements to Chris Kyle's story that we haven't been able to put into the film. Like, mm-hmm. you know, we talk about X number of tours of duty. Yeah. What does that mean? You know, what is, how long is a tour of duty? How many days was he actually in Iraq or you yeah. know, as a sniper? He says, these are the kind of elements that we want to bring out in the scene. So we're going to improvise it. I said, at that point in time, I went, uh. the pressure's <laughs> off. No, I mean, I, th- I'm thinking this is paradise. This right. is, this is going to be great. So we went over the, the elements that nice. he wanted, we, they wanted me to bring up in the scene, like, Talk about how long a tour of duty was, how many confirmed kills he had versus how many uh, he probably did did do. Right. Um, you know, but quite a, there were a number of beats, and so I, I show up on the um, uh, on you know in the room, and the fir- the first scene is of course it's in a small little office. I'm his therapist, yeah. and it's me, Bradley Cooper, the <laughs> uh, you know. The guy that's working the camera, right? And Clint Eastwood, right? That's it. That's the first, it, right? thing, first thing I do, I, I look around and thinking, how did I get into this position? Yeah. How am I here of all people? And and Bradley Cooper, you know, first of all, one of the nicest, oh, most yeah. talented actors out there, and this guy had transformed himself completely. Yeah. Into He's Chris Kyle, deal. he looked like Chris Kyle. He put on all this weight and not just, you know, ate a bunch of yeah. hot dogs. The guy put on serious um, muscle. Yeah. And he, he spoke the entire time in a, in a, honest real, to God, a, a Texas clip. accent. I yeah. mean, it was the real deal. And the only thing that gave him away was, you know, Bradley Cooper's got like steel blue eyes. I mean, they're, yeah. they're like, you know, you, you can't miss though. They're, they're, they're amazing. But, I, so I sat down there and I'm, you know, I'd been thinking, I'd read the script and I knew what happened prior to that, that there was a scene where he basically snaps at a kid's birthday party. Yeah. Where he takes off his belt. He's about to beat this dog and everybody screams at him like, you know, Chris, what are you doing? And everybody's scared. And he realizes that he's got a problem. Yeah. And everybody that I know, I'm sure you have, we've all been to therapy at some point in life. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. And I was thinking, how do I start this scene out? Because it starts with me and knowing what had transpired before. I thought, what is the one thing that if, if a therapist says to you is going to scare the shit out of you. And I said, so I started out the scene and it, and it made it to the movie. I said, um, your wife called me. Hmm. And at, and I, you know, we didn't rehearse this. We just started doing it. And he, Bradley could tell he was like, 
at that point he goes, you know, as an actor, he's thinking he, he knows, Yeah. you know, I can't bullshit my way around this. I've got to be, I've got to come out. I've got to be honest as yeah. no matter how painful it is. So I, I just started, I started it out that way. You know, can you tell me what happened? What, you know, yeah. have you ever thought that there are things that you've done there that you wish you hadn't done or seen and, and, and all this stuff? And he, at the end of the scene, as written, um, I'm supposed to give him a, uh, uh, you know, prescription or yeah. something, or, you know, for, you know, whatever the heck. And I said, and they said, you want the pad? I the, you know, because there's always, you know, crew person yeah. that has, deals with the props and says, you want? And I said, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Because I knew that they'd added a scene where I take him to go meet some of the actual injured uh soldiers yeah so i i said no i'm not going to i'm taking him this my therapy is going to be different than just giving him drugs right so i said no so we changed that all we changed that all around and we probably did the scene we did it quite a few times but we never stepped on one another's lines mm -hmm. at all with all that pressure and all that stuff that was leading up to it it was actually probably one of the easiest things I'd ever done as an actor Wow! because it was, you know, he and I were very connected yeah. at that, at that point. And it was just talking and listening and he's so good. And so in the moment yeah. that um, we never got lost and Clint's directing style is very interesting because he, you know, first of all, he, creates an environment on the yeah. set that is incredibly comfortable, incredibly relaxed. There's no tension. I mean, he's not like, you know, yeah. a nervous guy, you know, that goes in there and high strung <laughs> and, you know, you, you don't, you, everybody's, everybody's pretty chill. Yeah. You've got all the time in the world to do what you need to do. And he never says action. He never says cut. He just no says, kidding. he just says, okay, go. Mm -hmm. Stop. Okay. Let's go again. Okay, stop. I mean, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> I remember the we, prior to doing that scene, we shot the second scene first. And, um, and I was supposed to, you know, take Bradley Cooper in to meet these these soldiers. And we're around a corner going into a hallway and the camera's on the other, you know, around the corner. Mm -hmm. And I hear this, uh, this go. <laughs> I'm, like I'm, the... I'm waiting for action. I'm waiting for action. Wait, and Bradley that? turns to me and says, that means start. <laughs> so I said, okay, okay, I got it. So yeah, it was, uh, and, and it turned out to be, from what I understand, it was uh, Clint Eastwood's favorite scene in the movie. Awesome. It was the scene that they showed at the Academy Awards. That's right. That's uh, when right. he was nominated. Uh, when I left the set that day, I was talking to the, to the writer again. I said, you know what? This would make a great trailer, that mm -hmm. scene that we just did. And, damned if it didn't turn out to be the trailer for the movie. So if you yeah. look at the trailer for American Sniper, you're going to hear uh, a lot of the conversation that he and I had yeah. in, that, in that therapist room. That's and, amazing. Uh, yeah. And, and I, and I've, I've run into uh, to Bradley since then. And he uh, is, is an incredibly gracious guy. He is. And he's, uh, he's, yeah, he's, nice. he's terrific. I, I, he, I'm a fan. I'm a fan of his. Me too. He, he went to the same uh, master's program as, I should say I went to the same master's program as he did. He was there first. Oh. He, yeah. Um, Do you ever see the, those those uh, those um, those actors stud inside the actor studios? Yeah. Uh, so that's where the, he's that's he's the, actually in a couple of those where he's in the audience. That's the program. That's yeah, the, okay. Okay. Well, that's it. Okay. Inside yeah. the actor studio. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah, that's the program that um, I'm, I'm referring to. Um, oh, fantastic. Yeah, he was in the uh, he was in the audience, uh, and then. Yeah. Uh, I think eventually he was in the, was in the hot seat before <laughs> yeah, yeah. before Lipton uh, Pat, James Lipton passed. Uh, yeah, yeah. I used to love that show. I mean, I love those uh, those questions that he would ask at the end. Oh yeah, they were great. Yeah. It's funny because my I I went to the barber today and and I was like falling asleep the whole time and I looked up and I'm and he gave me like a half James Lipton mustache. I'm like, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what have you done? Uh, oh, well, then I have to ask you, what's your favorite curse word? <laughs> when you were seven years old. <laughs> he, he, I was like, where, was like, where do you find all this information, man? It's crazy. You know, um, yeah. it was a good show, though. It was oh, a my good goodness. show. Oh, my goodness. So, man, I, I mean, that movie was just powerful. You know, I mean, yeah. like, you know, my, my dad loved it. My dad hates movies, but uh, yeah. I mean, he doesn't hate movies, but he... He, he loved that, but he loves Clint Eastwood in yeah. general. Clint's old, old school, 
mean, it was definitely one of uh, Clint Eastwood's best films, and it made yeah. a ton of money. I mean, it was number one. It was made for, for 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 the content. It made enormous yeah, amounts. It's like worth over three hundred million dollars, I think, domestically, but which is crazy for yeah, a small like bunch of film. Worldwide. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, it just hit the chord at the perfect time. People were yeah. looking for, you know, a, a, a story of a hero mm-hmm. and uh, not just a, you know, superhero, yeah, but a, a real hero, uh, a guy that had um, problems that he had to overcome. Yeah. That challenges that was, that was very human and very, was, human. and it was a, uh, also a, an amazing love story. Yeah. Between him and his wife. And the way that he, he died was so tragic. It happened during the uh, the making of the film. And Thank God. That's yeah, right. They so had to it, change the... Yeah, they so had they to actually, change the... Yeah, yeah, they had the footage of his uh, of his funeral that they added to the end of the movie. That's... And he was he was killed helping somebody. Yeah. You know, he was... Uh, he was I mean, how ironic guy. is yeah. that? Yeah, it's 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 so tragic and so ironic and yeah, you it's know. A, they, listen, it's it's a real problem. I mean, he he understood it. He lived it. Yeah, he knew that the uh, the transition from from the role back into the real world was difficult, and mm-hmm. he made it. And it was incumbent on him. I mean, in that in that scene yeah. that I did with him. Uh, he sa- I asked him if he has any regrets, and he says that he didn't help, wasn't able to help more guys. Yeah. And I said, well, there's a lot of guys here that mm-hmm. need help. Are yeah. you willing to do that? You want to you wanna help them? I mean, I'm paraphrasing, and he said, okay. Yeah. I said, sure. So that was, uh, that was the moment that his life changed, and suddenly he had purpose again. And yep. his purpose was... He wanted to help people. He wanted to save people. That was why he was doing what he was doing. And it's traumatic. Yeah. You know, the movie starts out, the first person that he has to kill is a, I think is a, is a woman. I mean, that's, yeah. geez, come on. I mean, that's what these guys see. And he was, yeah. you know, he was legend. He it could be, yeah. but he oh, that's, did. That's, that's, that's what they called him. They called him the legend. Yeah. <laughs> that was his nickname. And, and he, I mean, it, it's just such a, a paradox it's such a yeah. you know contradiction yeah. to to be put in a position to have to save a life by taking a life and, yeah. and that yeah. the kind of t- turnaround that does to his psyche and yeah. and, and the tr- you know it's a, you cannot avoid the trauma in that yeah and these guys come back and you know that the, it's terrible what they have seen and what yeah. they've been forced to do and it's like okay it should it should all be done now. It's we we have evolved to a point where ninety nine point nine percent of the people on this planet will tell you they don't want war, and yet governments are still finding reasons to create them and 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 send our young men and women yeah. into these battles. And it's I'm, it's just like yeah. man, again, it, it takes me right back to the how we started this conversation. You know, talking about the fact that we're still fighting over oil and, and energy when we are, many of us already suspect and some people even know that there's, that we already have this technology that we don't need to be fighting over any of it. Right. And that's yeah, the that world would, that, that I would think, be, that would be interesting. That's a very interesting yeah. thought that, um, you know, if, if the information, if it's out there, you know, let's just say the, uh, you know, it used to be the, what was it, the perpetual motion device or something. I think once it yeah. starts going, it never stops. It's just like producing Free energy. Yeah, energy. The, the, there's if, a lot of names if, for if it. We that, uh, if we have that uh, alien technology that we're able to create all this clean energy yeah. with uh, unlimitless, you know, limitless energy, we don't have to worry about it. We, um, Why isn't it out there? Is is there something else that's associated with it that if 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 we were to admit that we have this power, all of a sudden everybody else goes back into the Stone Age? I mean, uh, in, it, in a sense, um, it, it's keep, and you know think, I, I I don't have as much faith. In, yeah, yeah. I don't have I was, as much faith in humanity because uh, because I'm I think that uh, you know we're you know we're 
we're we're pretty brutal species. Yeah, <laughs> we've proven that over over time. Well, I think uh, it, there, are, of course, there we are, can be. Uh-huh. Yeah, we can, yeah, we can well, be certainly. We, we I, I don't know. We can be. We are. I mean, you know, it, it's it's uh, there's but there's a lot of people that are that are incredibly kind. I mean, for every uh, you know, it, it, there's very few I, Mother Teresa's. Seems like there's more crazies but, out there. But this is this is again. This is how I think about it. The the people uh-huh. when we see this brutality, it's because people are in survival mode, right? It's be, when people yeah. go into this selfish, you know, the, the, they'll do anything to survive. And I feel like the the, the most brutal acts have been um, that we've seen, you know, besides the wars, which have happened for a number mm-hmm. of reasons, but you know, people the crimes that we see committed um, on a daily basis are more people just entrapped in a society that has not in any way allowed them to provide. And so the, the, you know, from the time that they were raised, there's, there's been no um, peace, you know, it's all been survival mode and that's, that can be traumatic for a child growing up, you know, and we know that from studies when they, they found kids in orphanages and these, you know, especially during world war two, they'd come upon an orphanage and they, they took these kids and they, they put them in the most affluent homes. And you know, what they found was those kids who were five and up, it didn't matter how affluent the home was. They were, they ended up criminals. They ended up with self-destructive behaviors and addictions, you know, and it's like, you can't fix that. Yeah. You're talking to somebody who, uh, believes, you know, that, in the childhood innocence is something that a naivete needs to be protected mm-hmm. for as long as possible. Because yes. I think that from that, because you're only that way for a very, very short time. Mm-hmm. And that's where the, the base is formed of where you understand who you are. Also, that's where creativity comes from. Mm-hmm. That's where all, you know, passion, all that stuff comes from. Um, so it really needs to protect it. But at the same time, two-year-olds are probably the most <laughs> cruel yeah. creatures out there. Imagine a, a two-year-old that is like, you know, 700 pounds, and, and, but have have those uncontrolled emotions and just well, blurts and out that, and hits and throws things. That's what happens but they're to, only two, to so they, men they, who are screwed up at two, I think. They become, they become walking yeah. children, you know? Um, Yes. And they do oh, a lot of yeah. harm. The immaturity, yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. We're we're in total agreement there. Yeah, and I, I, you know, just part of me thinks that so much strife that we see on the planet could have been a could have been avoided, should have been avoided, if not for the suppression of these technologies. Because everyone thinks that the suppression is about you may ET, be right, you know, and it's not about in my what I've learned in my in my extensive mad research over the past couple of years is that it's not, it's one of those not about ET, right? It's about, it's, it's, it's the cover up. The ET is a perfect front for the cover up, but the cover up has nothing to do with ET. It has to do with if people learn that how ET got here, it's going to be very apparent that we don't need fossil fuels. We we don't need anything that involves destroying the atom in any way. We don't need to burn anything. We don't need to, you know, we don't need fusion. We, all that stuff goes away, and so we have monopolies. Well, we've we've done we did built. we did an episode. I know we did an episode where uh, these guys who were working at one of the you know was with NORAD, you know, with those mm. missile silos up in Montana or something. Oh yeah, where all of a sudden they all went offline. It was like they were oh, somebody remember, flipped yeah. the switch and turned it off, and they're thinking they have the power to do that. Oh my mm-hmm. goodness! Wow. Okay. Yeah. And there's a lot so, of, there's you know, a it, lot of testimony about them coming over and turning off the nukes. And there's a lot of testimony from, from more than one source about times when we had the brilliant idea to uh, detonate nukes in space near the moon, just to, because yeah. we were running out of places uh-huh. to test them here. And I'm like, who's, who's yeah, idea? Just see what happens, right? Yeah. And, and, and let's, the, let's blow they were shut down. Bomb. In outer but space, this was an happens. actual idea, yeah. right? I mean, like, I'm, yeah, I'm just like, you know, why? <laughs> how how is that going to 
what are you going to study? The explosion? I mean, I, it, it blows my mind. But but uh, but many times, I've heard almost yeah. a dozen times, every time they launched, that, that UFOs, UAPs, whatever you want to call them, were present and disabled the 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 what do you call it the the they rendered the missile inert right and and sometimes yeah. they did it you know they it was very visible what was happening and they it, of course yeah. this pissed them off you know they were like what the, they can't yeah. do that right and <laughs> they're a threat and they're they're like no you can't blow holes into space it's not just you know you yeah you you have your planet but if you go up into space that's not yours you know you don't understand yeah there's a multi-dimensional we're the two-year-olds exactly yeah, we are the two-year-olds two you're exactly right <laughs> That is the, well, the Spiel, truth. Spielberg, maybe he has it right. I think he came up with a theory. He said that perhaps these aliens are not really aliens. It's basically us like 400,000 years into the future. Yeah. And we're coming back in time because we're about to do something really stupid. Yeah. <laughs> and then they yeah. want to either want to put a stop to it or they need to kind of intervene in some way or they're just going to take notes and watch it happen. I think there's a lot of weight to that theory. I mean, a lot of weight, crazy as it sounds. So. Well, Nick Nick Pope, who is the uh, uh, you know work, used to work yeah. for the uh, Ministry of Defense in, in England, said that he actually saw a an official document, government document, where it was explaining if aliens are here, why are they coming here? And you know, one was you know they're coming to you know to mine for minerals or whatever. Right. But the most interesting to me was the one they said. He said tourism officially in the document yeah. that maybe they're just here because it's an interesting place to go to see. It's like going to, you know, to Mexico on vacation. Let's just see what happens, you know, going to the zoo. Yeah. There's a great <laughs> book by uh, Dr. Um, I want to say Mike Masters. Um, if I'm, he was a guest, he was a guest on my, on my show a while back, but he wrote a book called identified flying objects. And, and he, and he, he wrote it, he wanted to write something that would kind of bridge the gap because he wanted his scientist peers to read it, but he also wanted the book to sell. So, but he goes at great length um, and explains how, you know, it's more likely that these are, this is us from the future than it is, um, you know, ET from, you know, the Andromeda. And I'm like, you know, he, he does a good job of laying out the scientific case for that because I guess I, apparently the odds are, time travel is is going to be something that we do accomplish you know i think if they've they've done all the math and and figured out that it is going to be something that happens in our future whereas they still haven't figured out how to do the math and figure out at what point in time we make contact with you know beings from another galaxy and i'm like well, you, yeah that... you you've seen that video from like the you know the 1900s or something in front of a movie theater or whatever and and a woman walks by and looks like she's talking on a cell phone oh <laughs> There's yeah all yeah. kinds of crazy stuff out there yeah giants and i mean you see some yeah so many unexplained things it's it's well, life that's is what, you know, that's, amazing life is fascinating would you really want to know everything wouldn't that be kind of Boring. No, I wouldn't. I would have nothing no. to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We wouldn't be able to have a conversation. We go. Yeah, you're right. 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 Yeah. Okay. Be I, no I, mystery. I, I already know that. I, I knew that. I spend all, most of my time, um, you know, digging and and getting. I don't want to say to the bottom of anything because there's no bottom. But you know, it's uh, well. It's that's a, it's, I, I, listen, it's also you know. interesting is that no matter how deep we dig. Yeah, we keep finding things older. Yeah, you think at some point it's like we've reached that's it, that's as far as we can go. That's that's the beginning. That's but no, yeah. and we keep it, finding more human activity, human yes. things. Like what are these footprints doing here? That's from. The, oh yeah, how are they? How are the two million year old footprints? Wait a minute. Yeah. Wait a minute. Okay, you know, like clearly we were missing something, right? We, yeah, there's. Well, one of the theories that was interesting that uh, I overheard at one of those alien cons was that this version of human civilization is not the first one. Mm -hmm. that the, the Earth basically recycles every, I don't know, I, yeah. I can't remember what they said, 500,000 years, whatever. You know, whatever's on the bottom ends up being on the top. What's ever on the top now is at the bottom. It's just kind of like a, a, you know, literally it's, it's, it's yeah. revolving like that. So that's why perhaps we... You know, there could be 
50, 100,000 versions of we, humanity we we, that have been born and died out and come back. Yeah. Um, and, it, and more and more, it looks like we're not going to be the ones that get it right. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's also that theory that, you know, no advanced human civilization or no advanced humans. Hu- what do they say? Any advanced civilization is doomed to destroy itself. Hmm. I mean, that's just what happens. I mean, part of what ha- part of what's happening on Earth is that our technology is way ahead of us. I mean, yeah. we're you know, our brains are still in that fight or flight syndrome. We've got that reptilian brain. It's yeah. like we're we're still cave people, and yet here we've got you know nuclear. Yeah, we're not mature enough, as, yeah. as opposed to a, a a pointed stick. You know, you know, only so much damage you can do with a pointed stick. But man, you get a you know cruise missile, you can do a lot of damage. And even that technology is is. It's so archaic and militant and, and, you know, the, the brute force propulsion technology that we have, even yeah. at its best is it's, it's, it's archaic. I mean, how, how fast do you want to shoot something into something else? It's just like, <laughs> you know, we've yeah, built how, a, how high is high? How fast is fast enough? Okay. It's like, uh, I feel like we've explored those limits. Maybe now yeah. it's time to look a little deeper, you know, I mean, instead of just, uh, so materialistic, you know, hopefully, Um, hopefully you're right. I'm, I, uh, I'm not as optimistic as you, but I'm, I'm (laughs) I'm certainly would prefer that. Yeah. We kind of, that we kind of pull the reins in a little bit, pull it together. And uh, if there is this, you know, limitless energy source that's out there that we have the ability to, to use, let's, Share it's it. Coming let's, up. let's, you know, you got to be careful because I'm sure there are, listen, there's oh, tons yeah. of people out there that would want to uh, use that. Well, that's the thing. You know, everybody wants to uh, cash in. Everyone wants to be the next Rockefeller, you know. Yeah. Uh, um, but the problem is <laughs> there's only ever going to be one. I mean, <laughs> there's, you know, there's a reason why we're still driving gasoline cars, even though the rest of the technology has advanced, you know, we, we have a hundred years of gasoline cars and people don't stop and scratch their head and be like, wait a minute, even electric cars, which came out before gasoline cars. And then the powers that be decided, let's go with gasoline for now. You know, then they're, they're rolling out electric cars as if they're new. Those aren't new. Those are the <laughs> Ford model T that first gasoline vehicle came after the Ford's electric vehicle. You could, I mean, you could see pictures of them that way back in the, the, the 19, I think like between 1910 and 1920. And, uh, I'm just like, this is not new. Even what Elon Musk is doing with, with his rockets is not new. You know, uh, we have this technology, man. I, 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 I think that we're going to see a pretty big breakthrough in the next five years because, um, more and more people are figuring it out. You know, I, more and more people are like, you know, quietly powering their, 23 acres in the middle of Kansas with these devices. Um, I've had, I've had uh, Chris Patton on my, and he's the great grandson of, of general Patton. Um, and he is just, a, I mean, he's knee deep in this stuff, you know, and he's trying to get countries to at least go geothermal, which is, e- you know, he's like, this is something that can easily be put in place um, right now, even with the infrastructure, you know, uh, that we have. And he's like, you don't need, to, to burn anything. You don't, it's, we, it's all here. Even if you just look at the ground, but there's a reason why, you know, Two words, even, Nikola Tesla. He that's had right. Out, right. He absolutely did. <laughs> but they left that poor bastard penniless in the Plaza hotel, which I, I just heard he was, was it the Plaza the hotel whole, it was one of those it was hotels. the Plaza. Really? Yeah. That's the, that's the, the same hotel went in and took all his stuff. Yeah. And I, and they have the papers, to, the, 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 Somebody got the papers, the the orders from the FBI to to prove. We did a we did a show about about him. We've done some amazing. Well, I, I think, heard he was because yeah. he was broke, but he was living at the plaza. And I'm like, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> I lived in New York City for 20 years. If you're broke, you don't get to live at the plaza. No. Okay? And what, what was the what, what's the uh, the kids' stories about the little girl that lived at the plaza growing up? I'm trying to remember what that what her name oh, was, but. Uh, <laughs> I know he had or something it. like that. Yeah. Somebody yeah, else. But I, I heard whoever's he was watching this is going, it's uh, saying the screaming the name out. Somebody's going to know. Yeah. Yeah. But I heard he was powering the plaza that he, that he had, he had rigged it up for him. I'm like, well, that's free, free room and board. Sure. Yeah, of course. <laughs> you know? of course. But well, before I let you go, my friend, let's go far out. Let me ask you, 
Have you ever seen, um, you know, have you ever looked in the sky and seen a, a UAP or UFO or? Uh, like, not, the not that I, not that I know of. I mean, why is it going from UFO to UAP? Is that like the new? Well, there's a lot of or something yeah. that too, but they, uh, it's phenom- cause it's phenomenon. They don't want you to necessarily believe it's an object. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, it could just be in your head. That's right. Yeah. Uh, not that, not that I know of. Um, but I, you know, as a kid, you know, we all, I've stared into the sky at mm-hmm. night, looked at the stars, looked at the moon and wondered what's out there. So I've always had that, uh, that curiosity, but no, I haven't actually that I know of <clears throat> Yeah, there, you know, I met a guy at a convention, this last alien con convention. He's told me that, uh, and this guy was former military, seemed to be pretty, pretty credible with yeah. his information. And he told me a story about some friends of his who are on the street. And uh, a guy comes up to him and says, can you describe me? And the guy says, yeah, you're like a preppy white guy. And his, one of his other friends, what are you talking about? The guy's a, he's a black dude. He says, no, 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 no. The guy is, he's an old, he's an old uh, you know, Armenian guy. So they all saw three different things. Even wow. though it was one person, the guy said, thank you and left. So maybe I've encountered an alien. Oh, yeah. Just haven't known it because they look like us. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and then maybe the reason why we don't acknowledge is because every time each one of us looks at that same exact creature, we see something different. Very true. Yeah. That's very true. And I, I really believe that, you know, our dreams and, you know, when we're not necessarily in a what we believe to be our waking state, you know, is something that is very accessible to them, you know, that they are very uh, adept with consciousness and um, and communicating with people in ways that maybe people don't always translate, but that is there. Um, and uh, I think for the most part, their influence is, is very positive and that they want to see us who, I, you know, I believe, I, I'm sure you've heard and are very familiar with, you know, how the great question of, you know, we're like, what is that? Where did they come from? But we don't know what we are and where we came from. And I believe that those two questions can be answered at the same time. Once we start to, uh, you know, get our, get our act together a little bit. You would Um, think, you would think (laughs) that if there were aliens out there, that they would contact me. I mean, come on. I'm the narrator of ancient aliens. Okay. I've got, I've got I'm gonna put access to Giorgio, it. okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make a few phone calls. I can get him on the show. Calls, okay? I can get him on the show. One phone call. That's it. I, I know. I know. There's a, st- a standing invitation. Any aliens that are listening, watching right now, if you want to be on Ancient Aliens, contact me. I'll get you on the show. Or Promise. listen, make, make an appearance. My, make an appearance. That's a, that. My friend, I just Robert, saw the cur- I just never, saw the he, I just saw the curtain move behind you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. it's, it's <laughs> kind of scary. Okay, <laughs> I wonder what that was. Um, no, but but uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, like, in the next six months, you totally see a, a UFO or there or something that in, is in the sky that you're like, what? That was not a plane or yeah. yeah um, it yeah. wouldn't surprise me at all because that that, that these things happen. I've well, feel here's like here's my, here's my problem. You see, I, I have glasses on. Uh, I've mm-hmm. had astigmatism since I was a kid. So if I'm, if I'm not wearing my glasses, everything looks like a UAP. <laughs> you look like a UAP. <laughs> well, maybe, we'll make sure you have your glasses on when they okay. show up. But my friend, it's been awesome. I'm, I'm so honored to, to talk to you. I'm, I'm a fan and I, and I know so many people who, uh, who you've affected with your work and your show. And we didn't even get a chance to get into, uh, some, some of the incredible games that you've voiced, but, yeah. but, um, you know, I know we started late. That's my fault. I, uh, no worries. I read my calendar wrong, but it's been an absolute pleasure and a joy to have you on the show, my friend. Uh, and for, for everybody out there, I, I guess I have to do my thing. So you can yeah, hear it because everybody waits for it. Is it possible? Could it be? What if it were true? Ancient astronaut theorists say, yes. There you go. That's awesome. Thank you so much. That's so cool. That's going on my highlight reel, too, for my you podcast. It. You got it, my friend. Thank this you was, so this much, This was Robert. a blast. I really enjoyed this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate you, man. You have All a good right. one. Take you care. Too. Bye.